In this ninth lecture, we look at topology. Topology is rubber geometry. It has many applications, for example, in understanding networks, so useful in calculus, or even solid state physics. Here is an illust illustration what topological equivalence means. Imagine a torus, and we can deform it, and it always has the same features it's the same topological features than the uh, original torus. Here is an example of a deformation which is not continuous, where we have punched in a hole into a sphere, made it a, a donut. Can we classify? Can you classify these figures according to topological equivalence? See that the, the ring and the key are special, so they have a hole while the others can all be deformed in this rubber geometry to, uh, say, a disk. <clears throat> what about this? This is a famous allegory in the picture. Uh, we see a cup and a donut. They are topologically equivalent. Uh, the, the deformation animation given in Wikipedia has been a multiple winner for the picture of the months. So here it is, lifted from Wikipedia, showing the equivalence of these two objects. Here is a visualization by Henry Segerman, one of the leading 3D printing artists. <clears throat> and here is another picture trying to explain this. Connectivity plays an important role in topology. <clears throat> we look at two notions, connectedness and simply connectedness. These are notions which do not change under deformations. So uh, connectedness, we have uh, on the left, we have two icons which are not connected. You see, you cannot go from any point on one flower to another point without leaving the flower. And uh, connectedness on the right hand side, we have two icons which are connected. Let's try which letters are not connected. <clears throat> Here you see, there are only two, I and J. And now we come to the concept of simply connectedness. Simply connected means that we can pull together any loop inside the region to a point. <clears throat> so it doesn't have to have, cannot have holes. On the left we have two figures which are not simply connected. On the right hand side we have figures which are simply connected. <clears throat> Here is a mark, it's not simply connected, it has this handle. A cup is simply connected. Which letters are simply connected? <clears throat> the common assumption is that simply connectedness assumes connectedness. So the letters I and J have seen are not connected, so they're also considered not simply connected. But which of the remaining letters are simply connected? Here we see the answer. There are Eight, which have a which have a hole somewhere which <clears throat> cannot be pulled together to a point. <clears throat> which digits are topologically equivalent? Well, this is a little bit more subtle, so we we don't only want to look at the connectedness, but we want to see which ones can be deformed into each other. And you see, there is one letter which is which is which is special. <clears throat> And that's the letter 8. It has two holes, so both uh, 8 and the letters with uh, one hole, 9, 0, 4 or 6, are uh, not simply connected, but they are not equivalent. 8 is not equivalent to 4. We have two holes in 8 and only one hole in 4. Let's look at the capital letters which are equivalent. <coughs> The classification is the same or similar than for the for the digits uh, zero to nine, and we see that there are uh, six, which or seven, which are not simply connected. B again plays a special role. B cannot be deformed in, into anything else. While uh, on the left we have the uh, we have the connect we have the simply connected ones. They can all be uh, deformed into each other. <clears throat> Here's a nice explanation from the Nobel Prize Laudatio from last year, where some work in solid-state physics has been honored. <clears throat> I 
What about fruits? There's a nice observation that all fruits are simply connected. Even if things are complicated, anyway, a carrot is not the fruit. <coughs> and this one, we don't even know what it is. Some humans like to topologically modify plants so that they are no more simply connected, like here, a tree. Let's look at clothes. Uh, you can see, can you see which clothes are topologically equivalent? See, you can check that the, the glove and the sock are topologically equivalent. It's also equivalent to a hat. <coughs> while the trouser and the pullover, they are different. So even the trouser and the pullover are different. You can do that by looking at the number of holes. So a trouser is just a sphere in, in, into which three holes have been punched in, while a pullover has four holes. <clears throat> is a bike simply connected? Of course not. What about this furniture? No problem now. And see that the chair is not simply connected, that the table, this table is simply connected. Actually, the chair is a sphere with six holes. This is the end of this first part. In this part B, we look at polyhedra. The subject has rich history and is still part of modern mathematical research. Polyhedra are beautiful objects. But it's surprisingly hard to give a precise definition of what a polyhedron is. This already starts in one dimensions, where we look at polygons. Most definitions of polygons would not consider the yellow figure to be a polygon. Some definitions insist on convexity and would exclude the star. The story goes back to the Greeks, in particular to Plato, who introduced regular platonic solids. The five platonic solids are the cube, the dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, and the icosahedron. I want to spend some time on the classification proof. It's not that easy, but very nice. We have to introduce some notation. Assume the polygons in our polyhedron are the n-gons, are n-gons, and assume that each vertex has degree m. This means that there are m edges attached to each vertex. If v is the number of vertices, E is the number of edges and F is the number of faces, then V minus E plus F is 2. We will come back to this formula later on. Now we can write, uh, we, but we can also write the number of faces F as 2E over N because every edge shares exactly two faces and we can write the number of vertices as 2E over M as every edge shares two vertices. You can now substitute F and V into the Euler formula and get uh, what we have at the bottom here. Let's look at that formula again. It can be simplified by dividing by E and putting the 1 over E on the other side. Now we have a nice equation where both sides are sums of positive fractions. Note that uh, N and M are both bigger than 2. There are only many, finitely many solutions to this Diophantine equation. Just try out what works and what doesn't work and get the classification of the five platonic solids. There's a nice duality between platonic solids. The octahedron is dual to the cube, the dodecahedron is dual to the icosahedron, and the tetrahedron is dual to itself. This duality is obtained by taking a face and replace it by a vertex in the center of the face. Faces which uh, are connected lead now to vertices which are connected. Archimedes already looked at more general polyhedra. He found them and Kepler proved that there are 13 of them. These solids are now called Archimedean polyhedra. Here they are. In the homework you will get acquainted with them a bit more. And here are the dual polyhedra. They are called the Catalan solids. Also, you will also name them in the uh, homework. Here is a computer rendering of uh, configuration where all the 26 is 26 uh, solids are combined, and uh, Gregor Lüdolf, one of the pioneers in 3D printing in the classroom, has printed these ones. These ones are out. These polydra are gr a great way to get into mathematics. Uh, also for me, this was uh, one of a fascinating subject. You see me here as a high school student. Behind me are some paper Archimedean solids I had built. <clears throat> One can also take a polyhedron and re refine it. This leads them to more complicated objects. 
We've already seen this formula. It's called the Euler gem. Why? Because it is a gem and one of the most beautiful formulas in mathematics. If you look at the ruby in the picture, count the number of vertices, V, the number of edges, E, and the number of faces, F, you get V minus E plus F is equal to 2. Here are the numbers V, E, F in the case of the five platonic solids. Already Descartes has counted them. He was the first to discover this Euler gem formula, but Euler was the first to, pro to prove it. We don't have the secret notebook of Descartes anymore, but Leibniz, who came across the encrypted notebook, once made a transcript. The story is told in the book Descartes' Secret Notebook by Amir Axel. <clears throat> Things became a little bit more complicated. Kepler found other solids which have regular polygonal, polygonal faces, but they are not realized as convex solids in space. Also, the Euler formula can fail here. Uh, this is well explained in the book Proofs and Refutations by Imre Lakatos, a Hungarian mathematician. The story is very interesting and the book is one of the pillars of our understanding of how mathematics is discovered. The Kepler solids are very beautiful. They appear in architecture like in the St. Mark Basilica in Venice. But polydra also appear in more mundane human ventures like golf. There the players shoot around polyhedra which have about 250 to 400 faces. Also soccer players chase around polyhedra, mostly truncated icosahedra. By the way, this solid is one of the Archimedean solids. More modern balls have simple symmetry. The last two incarnations which were used in the World Cup actually have tetrahedral symmetry. Here's an animation of all the soccer balls. <coughs> What about other dimensions? How many regular polytops are there in four dimensions? How many are there in higher dimensions? It turns out in four dimensions there are exactly six, and in higher dimensions there are only three. So here are uh, the first three polytops in four dimensions. The first one, the five cell, is a higher dimensional version of the tetrahedron. The eight cell is a higher dimensional version of the uh, cube. It's also called the tesseract. Uh, then there is a 600 cell, which is a generalizational higher dimensional version of the uh, icosahedron. And then we have the 16 cell, which is an analog of the octahedron. Uh, then the 120 cell, an analog of the uh, dodecahedron. And the 24 cell is a special one, it's the, the new one, uh, which is not based on anything before. It's very special, four dimensions is very special. And then in, three, in higher dimensions, five and more, there are only three. Alicia Boulle Stott <coughs> uh, coined the term polytops and was one of the first to investigate them mathematically. She's also called the Princess of Polytopia. Here's a page from her article uh, of 1910 and another page. And like others, Boulle Stott really was nicely illustrating the mathematics uh, with pictures. Ludwig Schläfli proved that there are exactly six regular polytops in four dimensions and three uh, in higher dimensions. So here is an animation which I made in 2009 about all these four polytops and five polytops you find it on, on YouTube. Don't repeat it here. Uh, let's look at some applications and connections to other fields. Kepler imagined the planets to be related to platonic solids. This naive harmonicis mundi picture turned out to be false. A polyhedron makes here a cameo in a picture of Albrecht Durer's, uh, Durer's Melancholia of 1514. Durer was a Renaissance artist. A picture of a Möbius strip, topological icon draw, drawn by, by Escher. One can see this as, as a polyhedron with boundary. Uh, it has only one side, a very special object in topology. Another strange polyhedron in a more general sense by Escher. Esoteric folks have, have tried to classify elements using polyhedra. We use them in symbolism, has been used in technology, in, uh, in movies. There is a movie called uh, Cube and there's a movie called Hypercube. Nature has realized some uh, radiolarians, beautiful creatures drawn here by Ernst Haeckel. Uh, in the very small compartments found in bacteria have icosahedral 
shape. Uh, in chemistry, uh, there are some uh, molecules, the Buckminster Fallerini C60, and it's now generalized in nanotechnology to more complicated polyhedra. And architecture, computational architecture here, Michael Hans Meyer, uh, Montreal Biosphere, Hope Forest, some building in Bali, small villa, and a geodrome in a greenhouse, the Zeal uh, in Frankfurt, and the Futuroscope. This is the end. In this last part, we want to illustrate how strange the world of topology can be. It also illustrates the need for a mathematics which makes these concepts rigorous. The first question is, can we embed a ball into space in such a way that the complement is not simply connected? The answer is yes. The object is called the Alexander Sphere. Here's a picture from the book, the math book. Alexander was a great topologist. He was also a mountain climber, interesting personality. Is there a three-dimensional space such that the complement is not simply connected? The answer is yes. Again, given by the Antoine necklace. Here's a picture again from the math book. This necklace is obtained recursively of a fractal type structure, uh, replacing a torus uh, in the necklace with, again, the entire torus. Can you turn a sphere inside out without ripping it apart? The answer is yes, and it's animated here in a movie by the Geometry Center. Also explained at various places on YouTube. I read somewhere that mathematicians can turn a sphere inside out. Yes. Is it true that every simply connected three-dimensional space is a sphere? This question was asked by Henri Poincaré. It called, was called the Poincaré conjecture. But the answer is now known to be yes, and it's a theorem. Uh, it has been proven by Gregory Perelman. <clears throat> Is it easy to decide whether two knots are equivalent? Is it easy to describe whether a knot is trivial? Such questions are still very much under investigation. One knows, for example, that there is no machine which can decide that, in general, two knots, whether two knots are equivalent or not. We will come to the limits. Of in this part C, we look at Euler characteristic. It is a number attached to a geometric object. If two objects have different Euler characteristics, they are not topologically equivalent. Here's the definition. We formulate it in a more general framework of graphs. Where we have vertices, edges. We look also at triangles in this graph. These are called the faces. In this example, we see seven vertices, eight edges, and one face. The Euler characteristic is zero. We can now go back to the letters we have looked at in the first slideshow. Let's look at the letter A. We can triangulate it. And uh, in this case, we have uh, 13 uh, vertices and 26 edges and 13 faces. And uh, if we add V minus E plus F, we get zero. Here's a computation in the case where the letter is simply connected. In all these cases, the Euler characteristic is 1. So 7 plus 5 minus 11 is indeed uh, 1. Uh, here is the letter B. We have triangulated it with 22 vertices, 49 edges, and 24 faces. And the Euler characteristic in this case is minus 1. <clears throat> Historically, the subject of topology was born with the Königsberg bridge problem. Seven bridges. The question was whether it is possible to find a closed path which passes over each bridge exactly once. And the answer is no. Uh, the story is well told in this clip from the movie The Story the seven bridges of, of Königsberg. Topology allows us to investigate surfaces also. We can look at the Euler characteristic here too uh, and distinguish surfaces. So here is a triangulation of the uh, torus. We can count the number of vertices, number of edges, and number of faces. In the torus case here, we get zero. Uh, for the sphere, the answer is two. This is the reason why in in the Euler polyhedron formula, we always get two. These polyhedra are discrete spheres. Here's the Klein bottle. The Euler characteristic is zero. And for the projective plane, this one, the projective plane is a surface you obtain by identifying opposite points on a sphere. <clears throat> the story of Euler characteristic is well told in the book Euler's Gem, 
I've already mentioned the secret notebook thriller where the discovery of the Euler formula is told. The theory of networks belongs here into the, this topic. In principle, networks, network theorists and topologists do very similar things and one can see the richness of the subject when looking at the literature. And this is the end of part C. In this last part, we want to illustrate how strange the world of topology can be. It also illustrates the need for a mathematics which makes these concepts rigorous. The first question is, can we embed a ball into space in such a way that the complement is not simply connected? The answer is yes. The object is called the Alexander Sphere. Here's a picture from the book, the math book. Alexander was a great topologist. He was also a mountain climber, interesting personality. Is there a three-dimensional space such that the complement is not simply connected? The answer is yes. Again, given by the Antoine necklace. Here's a picture again from the math book. This necklace is obtained recursively of a fractal type structure. Uh, replacing a torus uh, in the necklace with, again, the entire torus. Can you turn a sphere inside out without ripping it apart? The answer is yes, and it's animated here in a movie by the Geometry Center. Also explained at various places on YouTube. I read somewhere I read that read mathematicians somewhere. can turn a sphere, turn inside, a sphere inside, out. inside out. Yes. Is it true that every simply connected three-dimensional space is a sphere? This question was asked by Henri Poincaré. It's called was called the Poincaré conjecture. But the answer is now known to be yes, and it's a theorem. Uh, it has been proven by Gregory Perelman. <clears throat> is it easy to decide whether two knots are equivalent? Is it easy to describe whether a knot is trivial? Such questions are still very much under investigation. One knows, for example, that there is no machine which can decide that in general two knots, whether two knots are equivalent or not. We will come to the limits of compatibility of computability later. Is there a space which is connected but not path connected? We have not distinguished between connectivity and path connectivity in the introduction slides, but connected means that we cannot split the space into two open subsets. There are examples which distinguish that from path connectivity, and the simplest example is the graph of the function fx is equal to sinus 1 over x, the devil curve. Is there a surface which has only one side? The answer is yes. It is the Möbius strip we have already seen in this Escher, from the Escher picture. But there's another example, the Klein bottle. Here is a picture of Jeff Johnson, an artist. This is the end of this Strange World presentation.